So thank you all for participating, and it's a great honor to be moderating this panel this afternoon. I will try to remain as invisible as possible, because you certainly don't want to hear from me when we have such esteemed speakers on the panel. Uh, I will be introducing each one of the panelists and then laying out some of the topics that we'll be discussing this afternoon. Each one of the panelists will give an approximately 20-minute presentation uh, citing a couple of examples of practices and experiences that they've had that may trigger uh, subsequent conversation. And then after each of those 20-minute um, presentations, I would encourage all of you to engage our panelists in discussion, in questions, and then I hope that our panelists will have questions one to another. Uh, so this will be a very fast whirlwind through a variety of different topics. Uh, our three panelists today uh, include, at your far right, Nancy Marie Mithlow, who is Associate Professor of Art History and American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and she has been involved in projects at the Venice Biennale six times and has a diverse and wide variety of experiences across the United States and internationally. Uh, in the middle of our panelists is Irene Hoffman, who is the executive director of Site Santa Fe. She has been there for about two years, and we were discussing earlier at lunch how Irene has this sort of experience almost every exhibition at Site Santa Fe. It's certainly something very new for many of us uh, here in Albuquerque to be hosting exhibitions of this technological bent. And uh, closest to me is Danis Montes de Oca Moreira, who has been for, since 2003, the curator of the Havana uh, Biennial. And uh, luckily, the United States government, in their generosity, decided to let her come to the United States. Uh, but she found out that her visa had been granted one day before she left. So we're very pleased that Denise is here with us today. Each one of the curators on our panel has been engaged in biennials uh, for at least the, the last decade. And uh, we're very interested in what this means. What is the context of biennials? What can we learn from producing a uh, exhibition of this type, of this nature, and of this regularity? Um, and what is the point of creating biennials? Uh, who do we respond to? Who is the audience? Uh, who are we really serving? Uh, were, we will be discussing ideas of institutional versus independent support for these projects. Uh, and asking ourselves what is our role as curators in projects like this. Um, each one of the presenters will be creating a, uh, presenting a brief background of their experiences with biennials, a little bit about uh, where they see themselves fitting within the larger world of art. And um, then we'll be also discussing how do we use technology in our galleries. Um, does it augment the discussion of artwork? Uh, sometimes can it be an additional mediating layer uh, that sometimes obfuscates our understanding of the works of art? Or is it a helpful process in, um, in art museums and art galleries? Um, you, this use of technology, how does that change our work, the work that we do as curators? Uh, and how does that change the visitor's experience of the works of art? And finally, one of the topics that each one of the presenters will be addressing is uh, how can we experience art through a diversity of technologies uh, that may not have been presented as technological works of art themselves. In other words, um, is there a way that technology can help us understand uh, silver photography, darkroom photography? Is there a way that technology can help us interpret painting and sculpture? in traditional media. Uh, so it's a great honor for me to introduce these three speakers, and we will start off with Nancy Marie Mithil, Associate Professor of Art History and American Indian Studies, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you, Andrew, for that kind um, introduction. And I wanted to give particular thanks to Suzanne Zabarge, the Director of 516 Arts. Um, this panel had its birth in the conversations that I had with Suzanne following my experience as being a selector for ISEA. And I started to do a lot of self-inquiry about my power 
And what does it mean to arbitrarily select some things as going forward and other things as not going forward? And we had such a wealth of information to draw from. There are hundreds of submissions. And you know, after a while, you become a bit blind to the process, right? You're, you're exercising some part of your brain that's hard to articulate. And, and I wanted to talk more about that. I wanted to talk about boundaries. What did it mean that we were looking at this artwork through a computer screen and not looking at it physically? You know, what did it mean that some people were in, some people were out? What did it mean even to have the ability to be able to submit in the first place, right? You have to have access to a certain level of technology, a certain sophistication, even to be a participant in any kind of art exhibit. What, what was that class divide about? Were there racial divides at play, gender divides? Um, is there a disability critique there? You know, I just, I wanted to think more thoroughly about this. So I asked Suzanne if we could, you know, devote some time to this during the conference. And I'm, I'm very grateful, Suzanne, that you made this opportunity possible for us. And um, thank you to the rest of my panelists for being here. Um, I wanted to start with the process of the Venice Biennale. And this is a very strange and wonderful journey that I've been on for 12 years. Um, I really didn't know anything about the Venice Biennale in 1999, which was my first exhibit. Um, I'm an educator. I'm an American Indian. My tribe is the Chiricahua Apache tribe, which has just been recognized as the 23rd tribe in the state of New Mexico. We are a diaspora tribe, and after 120 years, we have returned to our homelands. We were compensated in the 70s under the Indian Claims Commission for all of southern New Mexico and Arizona at 1886 prices. Um, we were not recognized as a federally, yeah, that's you know, difficult. We, we weren't recognized as a federally um, um, official tribe uh, until the late 1970s. Chiefs in Mangus, Colorado, so that is our, our heritage. So. Um, being able to be back in the state and to be able to address this audience as a, as a curator from that cultural background is really important to me. I've been an educator primarily with the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe uh, for almost 30 years now. I was a student at the Institute of American Indian Arts and I learned museum studies there. Um, IA, IA, for those of you who don't know about it, is just an hour up the road. It's the only federally chartered tribal college devoted to the arts. So I always try to give them recognition. I became aware of the Venice Biennale through an Aboriginal Australian educator and artist by the name of Brenda Croft. Her brother, Lindsay Croft, was a faculty member in an American Indian program in Santa Fe, again, an hour north of us. Um, and he was very devoted. He, uh, to me, recognized, he represented the best of indigenous knowledge and indigenous wisdom. He was a faculty member who died tragically in a car accident the year that I was running a program out of the College of Santa Fe. And through that tragedy, I became aware of the world of Venice because Brenda Croft was curating the Aboriginal, excuse me, the Australian pavilion uh, with Aboriginal Native women artists. Um, for those of you who don't have a background on Venice, which I didn't have some 12 years ago, it's known as one of the oldest, most prestigious international venues. It's also very Western. It's based on a kind of World's Fair analogy. There are national pavilions, and either you're in or you're out. But what we discovered through Brenda's participation and her invitation for us as indigenous peoples to come join her in Venice, Italy, didn't know where Venice, Italy even was when I went, um, what we learned from that is that actually the Venetian people feel themselves to be indigenous to the nation state of Italy, and they felt a political connection to us trying to make a national stance there. Um, the first year that we exhibited, Harold Zeman was the curator of the Venice Biennale, and we actually just wrote to him and said, we are a sovereign nation, and we are not represented by the United States Pavilion, and we want you to represent us and our own self-sponsored pavilion. And he wrote back and said, yes. And so somehow we got together enough cash and enough interest to go. And we took 10 artists. That was in 1999. And every year it's been very addictive. We keep going. The first year it was totally free. The Venice Biennale did not charge us a dime to go. And they put us in their catalog. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. We felt like we were included. We were actually human beings with the rest of artists internationally. 
The next year, 2001, same thing. We're invited back. Somehow we scraped together money and interest, and we went, and we had a, a presence there. 2003, things started to change. The Biennale started charging money, 5,000 euros. 2005, it was 20,000 euros. We couldn't afford to go anymore, but by that time, we had fallen in love with Venetian people, and they had fallen in love with us. And so they enabled the University of Venice to give us free space and the city of Venice to give us free space. They kind of adopted us. And for us, that's very indigenous. And I want to just talk about that as being an indigenous form of curation. When I teach, I talk often about what I call American Indian curatorial practices. And for me, that means long-term, mutually meaningful, reciprocal relationships that contain mentorship. So I'm a bit of an odd panelist today because my only one experience is really Venice. Because it's long term and it's reciprocal and it's mutually meaningful to us. And we bring students and there's mentorship. So out of all these projects, um, I'm going to present just a little bit on 2011. The title of this was Epicentro, Retracing the Plains. And you can see these uh, quick time moving images behind me of that exhibition endeavor. Um, I, this was led by the Dirty Printmakers of America, the DPA, and uh, the artists uh, who participated in this were John Hitchcock, Joseph Velasquez, uh, Emily Arthur Douglas. Um, we also had participation from um, Ryan O'Malley. And what you can see is it was a very active making. Uh, the artist, some of them, Melanie Yazzie was also in this group. We're very fortunate to have a printmaking residency on the island of Murano before the Biennale. And so they were making art on site. You, you know, we're talking about technology as well. This is probably, to me, like the most sort of physical, simple kind of technology. And I don't mean to be demeaning when I say simple, but ink on paper, OK? Ink on paper. But what made this very alive is that they're producing it on site. I'm going to start it again. and taking digital images and projecting these images. So here you see Emily Arthur, who is projecting her bird series onto a pregnant Madonna at the Academia. And in that way, gifting. So again, this is an indigenous methodology, is that whenever you're in a place, you gift. And it creates a mutual obligation between people. So not only were we having this mutual relationship with our Venetian colleagues, but also wanting to mutually engage with the, the ancient and very important artwork of Venice. The other part is um, there was sort of a giveaway. Giveaway is another kind of form of gifting in which you are, again, forming bonds, but doing it in a way that doesn't necessarily have a recipient. So the artists of uh, Epicentro were giving away freely their prints uh, to the people of Venice. Sometimes they would slip it into a backpack of a crowded Venetian street of a tourist. Um, or they would project the images onto the walls and have Venetian people walk through them, or the people who were there at the Biennale. This is uh, one of the artists, Ryan O'Malley, who's working with a street artist. He's doing wheat pasting. He's uh, interested in these issues of uh, animals and extinction. Um, that the theme of this one really has to do with a critique of the United States military industrial complex. Um, my tribe, the Chiricahua Apaches, are prisoners of war at Fort Sill. Um, this is John Hitchcock that you see in the black and white. He's Comanche. They're actually right next door to us in western Oklahoma. We call ourselves the KCAs, the Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. And um, Right next to Fort Sill is the Wichita Wildlife Mountain Refuge. So actually what's happening here in America is that there's a fort that's still active today. It's the largest artillery base in the free world. That's how they advertise themselves. Um, it's where my people were prisoners of war, where my grandfather was basically imprisoned um, in my lifetime. And, and then there's this refuge for animals right next door. So it, it's all this federal complex, and it's very... Uh, disconcerting um, that animals are somehow um, have higher status than human beings. It's, it's kind of a critique that John was very interested in trying to make. So, so what do we learn from this? Uh, what we've learned from my experience in the Venice Biennale is that anything is possible. That if you want something, you ask for it. 
uh, that it's important to be able to recognize culturally specific curatorial mandates, which for us meant this gifting. Uh, it meant having a long-term relationship with people. And it also meant that the Biennale structure itself is not the only entry point. There's several entry points. Um, when we do these projects, we often don't care about an audience, and they're not object-based. It really is the experience of being present on an international stage and having artists feel empowered that they have a voice and they have a place. Now, I'm going to switch just a little bit and give you just a few minutes because my time's up and I want to hear the other panelists to an exhibit that I'll be opening in January of 2013 in Santa Fe at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. This is the official wing of the Institute of American Indian Arts. I'm co-curating it with Ryan Rice, and the title of it is Thicker Than Water. This is where I want to talk a little bit about technology. My interest in this exhibit is about blood memory. And what does it mean that we have photographs? How do we remember ourselves and our past? How do we construct memory from those images? So I'm going to switch up here and segue into a PowerPoint. Okay, Andrew, I think I've got, what, three minutes or something like that. This is the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. I encourage you to go visit it. Again, this is kind of where I was trained and is, is my adopted home that I call that space my living room. Uh, this is the work of Brenda Croft. So if you remember when I told the Venice Biennale story, I said there was this amazing Aboriginal woman who's an artist and a curator who took the Australian Pavilion in 1997. This is some of her work. So I've invited her to come back in to Santa Fe and to show this series, East West. Uh, Brenda is the product of a, what they called at the time a biracial marriage. Her dad is Aboriginal, her mom was white. And she's done this sort of photo montage that I think is really fascinating. The size of these are fairly large. Um, and our interest in, in Thicker Than Water is talking about how we reckon our own ties to family and how do we intervene with that and what does it mean to be, uh, in this case, a modern and indigenous person. This is her father, Joe Croft. One of the other artists is Tom Jones. He's Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. He's been my constant collaborator uh, in my posts there. This is another Biennale exhibit example from the exhibit Rendezvous. These are non-natives who dress as natives and act as natives in encampments. And uh, as this was described by Rick West, the previous director of the National Museum of the American Indian, Tom Jones has a compassionate camera. Uh, he also photographs his own people, the Ho-Chunk people. And the piece that he's going to be doing, the one example I have here is identity genocide. What's happening in his tribe is that to be a member of the tribe, actually new applicants have to prove their um, racial uh, connection through DNA. And uh, he's very disturbed by that process, so he's doing a portrait series. So we're looking primarily at, at portraiture. The other two artists, and I'm just going to go through quickly because I want to end and listen to the other panelists, Anna Solericus, who's Dene in Greek. She's known for doing performance art and lens-based work. This is a performance that she did with the Travois when she was a student at Dartmouth. And Greg Statz, who is interested in the Iroquois condolence ceremony. And he does film and, again, is, is uh, showing some artifacts. So um, I want to leave it at that and pass the microphone over to Irene. Thank you for your interest and attention. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by um, introducing um, a, a bit of my background and the kind of um, curator I am. I've worked in many different kinds of museums um, and with each museum have, have found that I need to be um, a slightly different kind of curator um, given the context of my institution, the history, the collection, the community. Um, and so here's a bit, uh, really quickly, where, where I've been. Um, one of the, lo the largest museums in the country, where um, Marcel Duchamp was my inspiration. Um, a modernist icon, um, a collection that celebrated design in America, the intersection of Eames, Knoll, Bertoia, and Eliosarnin, was my next stop. 
Then on to a suburban oasis deep within the OC in Southern California. And then to a tiny, scrappy, socially engaged, and fearless museum in a gritty urban setting. And now to a dynamic contemporary art space in a former beer warehouse in a town of only about 60,000 that ignited a contemporary art scene when it was founded about 17 years ago. Um, so, and along the way, I have been engaged in two, uh, two very different kinds of conversations around biennials in California. I curated several California biennials that was really looking at a younger generation of, of artists showing what was happening um, throughout the state of California um, and filling our museum uh, in Newport Beach with, with, um, with works from those artists. And now at Site Santa Fe, an institution that began as a biennial and uh, I arrived at a moment where I was really charged with really challenging that, rethinking that, and I will tell you a little bit about what we've been up to in terms of site's signature exhibition. But I also want to talk a little bit about my relationship to new media and some of my work trying to bring technology and new media into the museum, both as artwork but also as tools for experiencing um, artworks, sometimes with great success and other times um, uh, found that perhaps the audience wasn't quite that interested or ready or, or, or prepared um, to try the new tools that we were trying to introduce into our galleries. So I begin going back to um, my time at the Orange County Museum of Art. I was curator of contemporary art there. And as part of the uh, California Biennial, one of the things that we did was really looked at uh, trying to bring uh, new media into the museum and making a, a real commitment um, to creating a space that could accommodate this kind of work. And that led to what you see here, the Orange Lounge. Um, this is actually in one of the most sort of high-end shopping centers in Southern California. Uh, receives more visitors to this particular shopping center than Disneyland, although they did not come to my new media space. Um, and over the course of about five years, it was a five-year experiment, we staged new media exhibitions in this space, did a lot of um, acquisitions for the collection, had a whole series of works that could be accessed online. We um, worked with future farmers who did our website. And it was quite an active five years. Um, it was an interesting kind of moment to really think about how we experience this work. And understanding that, that there was a lot of fatigue in museum gallery spaces when presented with screens and headphones and durational artwork. And so we started to really think about an architecture, uh, a physical space that really thought about bodies um, and experiences and comfort. So we created this lounge that had lots of different ways of experiencing uh, an artwork that might present itself at, on, on a single computer screen, um, including experiences lying down with headphones, um, terminals that were, were, could be more, um, you could experience a single piece with a small group of people, a larger sort of uh, pool of seating that allowed a whole classroom to all participate on screens and have a discussion about artworks. Over the course of those um, several years, we had shows with um, Yusef Merhai and Paper Rad and Josh Own and Alan Rath and Shirley Shore, and looking at a whole range of artwork from computer-based um, works um, to robotics to uh, strictly um, video installation works, um, some really fantastic um, Pippalotti Wrist and um, major Namjoon Pike works were also part of this um, experiment. It closed after five years, but I think in, in, the, in the, um, 
the space of that time, the learning curve for myself as a curator um, was steep, but also very exciting, and also for my audience. And it, I think it really changed how we started to move forward, having a better understanding of, of how this work was created and the challenges of bringing this kind of work into a museum setting. Um, here's a little um, screenshot of what the, the um, uh, wonderful website that Future Farmers created for us for the, what we call the Orange Lounge. Then moving to Baltimore, my interest in new media um, continued and finding myself at a museum called the Contemporary Museum um, was really interested in, in trying to find out what was happening with cell phone technologies at the time. And I did a show in 2007, turns out it was the first of its kind in a museum, and it was a survey of artworks being made with and for cell phones. So using different kinds of technologies, um, the, the, the cell phone as a um, image making device, as an image playback device, using texting as a way of um, engaging an audience, using it sculpturally. Um, uh, in this case, this was Information Lab cell phone disco. Maybe some of you have seen this piece. It's had a wonderful uh, life over the years. Um, a room filled with tiny LED lights that only start to light up when you make a phone call, um, revealing all of the radiation coming from your cell phone. Yeah, fun. <laughs> um, Beatrice Valentine Ammerhein, this amazing chandelier of 50 Nokia phones, all playing a uh, separate individual video of a different part of her body. Um, so here, technology and body become merged in this really beautiful chandelier. You can see it there as it was in the, the entrance space of our show, Cell Phone. Um, Mark Shepard's Tactical Sound Garden, um, an interactive uh, project from Blast Theory, and uh, text-based work by Paul Notzel were all part of, of uh, this exhibition. Um, so the experience of sort of working very directly with um, new media-based work and bringing it to an audience um, now has taken a sort of different, um, uh, a different uh, road for me now at Site Santa Fe. So this is where I am now. This is uh, what our building looks like today. Uh, this is a former beer warehouse, 20,000 square feet in Santa Fe's uh, rail yard. I hope some of you are going to be coming for the Santa Fe Day in the, uh, next week. I will be there to greet you and introduce you to our current exhibition called More Real Art in the Age of Truthiness. Um, a sort of silly title, silly word truthiness, um, but a very serious kind of underpinning of this word coined by Stephen Colbert on, in 2005 on his very first episode of his um, satirical news program, posing that we live in a moment when truth is really quite elusive and we will believe things are true with often very little information. Just wishing it to be true can often be enough for um, the culture today. And so within More Real, you will see artworks that, that take a whole range of forms, from straight photography um, to works that delve into the reality of second life um, uh, and, and, and a reality that may be, in fact, more real than real for, for many people. So I hope you will come in and join us um, uh, for, for our, our welcome to the Santa Fe Day on Monday night. What you're looking at here is the front of the building. It is an um, a intervention by the architect Greg Lynn. We hired him to come and take a look at our very um, uh, a brown, uh, plain building that no one could really figure out um, where to find the entrance to. So Greg really helped with this extraordinary entrance feature. Um, that includes a lot of his sort of signature materials, but also these wonderful biomorphic forms. So moving into the space, you can see, again, Greg Lynn um, guides us into the gallery space. And you can see just peeking through that 
portal there, um, a, a series of photographs by Thomas DeMon. Um, also in this lobby space, there's that brown door that you see there. In that door is a performative piece, um, a piece by Mark Dion that I hope you'll have a chance to experience. These two works and one other are ones were that we delved into an experiment with using technology in our gallery space to augment the experience of artworks. When we first began thinking about this show, we thought it would be really, it would be how great it would be to use QR, QR codes in our show. By the time our show showed up, QR codes seemed really kind of lame. Um, and, and, and we didn't quite know what to do with this idea, and we didn't see people using them in museums, and they weren't leading us to anything very interesting. Um, so we tried an experiment that, in a show called More Real, um, there are many questions as you go through as to what you're looking at. Is what you're looking at real? Trompe Loy has a wonderful sort of sub-theme in the exhibition. Um, so we decided to use that technology of the QR code, not just to send you to a website with more information that may or may not be interesting or engaging or even you be able to properly upload at that moment, but actually invite the audience to rewrite or rename the artworks in the exhibition. So when you step up to the Thomas DeMond uh, photograph, of a paper construction of the Oval Office, so it's all paper, um, cardboard, and confetti, photographed, life-size. That's the piece that's hanging on the wall. And when you, when you do use the, engage the QR code, you have an opportunity to name the piece and completely rewrite the label. Um, and, and so what I am showing you here is a screenshot of something that you will experience as you use the QR code, but is also something you can use when you visit our website. You can rename three works in the exhibition, and every week a new label, a new title, and a new description is, is presented. And many of them are far more interesting than the labels that we wrote for the, for the exhibition. So, so the one that we're looking at here, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, one of the chosen new titles is The Hot Seat. Um, what place is more treacherous, more uncertain, and fragile than the Oval Office, made of paper? Thomas DeMond, known to ritually destroy the sculptures he creates as photographic subjects, here captures the tension and the un uneasy uh, of the grand seat of power, awaits conf conflagration, purification, and rebirth. The Hot Seat, that was our featured label um, last week and is certainly engaging our audience in a, in a different kind of way. So I wanted to share that with you as something that we are trying now um, within our galleries to use technologies to invite the audience in in a much more interactive kind of way. Um, I, I want to um, end by sharing a little bit about you know, how this particular show um, fits into the larger work that we're doing at Site Santa Fe relative to our biennial. Um, for those of you who know our institution, this summer would have been a year to have an international biennial at Site. I arrived two years ago, and there was a very strong feeling that things had changed in the art world dramatically. When Site was founded as a biennial, it was the only international biennial in the United States. And that was pretty bold. It's pretty bold to be doing that in Santa Fe. And in a lot of ways, it put our institution and Santa Fe on the map in the contemporary art world. But over the years, there are now more and more biennials. The, the term, the word, um, has been used by so many um, cities, mayors, um, initiatives to try to bring, drive tourism, um, that our biennial, in a lot of ways, was feeling less um, important. Um, perhaps lost in a sea of an ever-expanding contemporary art world where there is now a biennial somewhere in the world that you can visit nearly every week or an art fair. And so in all of that noise, in all of that, where does our bold, initially bold biennial fit in? Uh, and so my decision was to stop the cycle, um, take a look at what 
site was really great at and and try to define what we were without our biennial um, and that was to really kind of augment our current our, our exhibition program um, but canceling the biennial I think was very um, uh, in some ways confusing um, caused a lot of people to be very excited to see it go. Um, I heard from, from the whole range from fear about what it would mean for our city if it was no longer around to relief that we were really thinking about this and, and trying to find a way to bring back new life to it. And so that's what we are doing. Um, we are working on a new plan for our biennial. I don't know if we're going to call it biennial. I know what we will call it, and we will be announcing our new plans at site um, in May of 2013. And you will see an, a newly configured biennial style exhibition uh, appearing in the summer of 2014. I think for our institution, we have thought a lot about what it means to put on a biennial, the costs of it. Um, um, how it how it impacts our community, um, the economy of our city, and I, I think it's a it's a conversation. It's a questioning that is happening at a lot of institutions um, around the world that are contemplating starting their own biennial. Um, so, I wanted to share with you um, our plans at Site Santa Fe to um, rethink and reimagine what a biennial. Um, it, at this moment can be um, in a place like Santa Fe. So I will end there. Thank you so much. And I will turn off this computer. And I think we're going to do a little text switch from Mac to PC. So give us just a minute. And our next, our next speaker will be Denise Montes de Oto Morera. And uh, assisting Denise uh, will be Dr. Michelle Sanchez, who is the here. Director of Education at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. And Michelle will be, if needed, a translator. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge the assistance of Agnes Chavez, who is an artist based in Taos. And Agnes has been a terrific help in coordinating Denise's travel, her arrangements. And I want to thank you very much for making Denise's possible. Agnes also has a spectacular installation on view in the North Gallery here at the museum called X Trees. Uh, she is also the coordinator of educational activities and educational programming for the Isaiah 2012 conference. So she has she's wearing many hats today. Thank you very much, Agnes, for your help. Mm. Hello. Uh, thank you very much to the organizer of this event and to the organizer of the panel because the invitation to me, because to invite me, and thanks to you. Uh, every time that I have to be outside Cuba to do a presentation, I want to talk in Spanish because my English is not so good, but every time uh, the people consider that it's more important to try to uh, communicate my ideas in English than to use a, a, a translator in order to to use the time in a more efficient way. When I was a student at the Havana University, uh, I began to study in 1984, just at the moment that appeared the Havana Biennial. I was very loved from the very beginning of the, about this project because this project not only was very important for to the Cuban artists, but also to the transform the geopolitical scene of the art in the world, around the world. It is very important to know that before the Havana Biennial, there was just uh, two biennial, two international biennial, uh, the very big biennial, Venice Biennial and uh, Sao Paulo Biennial. And these are, these were two kind of model or kind of biennial projecting to the international artists and uh, galleries and collectionists. And the way to participate is through the embassies, through the galleries, through the countries. And in the case of the Cuban Biennial, uh, the collect this collective want to introduce a new uh, model attending to the artists of the First World. 
and for the first time appear an international event that consider the importance and the uh, different point of view that introduce the art of uh, our countries, like Latin American countries, African countries. And. But in the middle of that, I was working also with the um, Cuban contemporary art. It means that I have been always, I have been always between the project, the international projection of Cuban artists and the uh, projection of uh, artists from the Third World in Havana, what means uh, uh, an international projection, because at the moment of the Havana Biennial has place every, uh, every two years or every three years, because actually it's the only biennial on the world that appeared um, every three years because the economic situation, because the bureaucracy, because every, a lot of things. And uh, this is because the, um, I, I am trying to explain all this idea to you because I want to show you two exhibitions, one about Cuban arts and the other one about the last biennial. Both are uh, related to the technologies and the preoccupation for me has been always how to present a, an artist uh, from Cuba that wants to work with technology outside the country and uh, how to connect this production, which is uh, made with very rustic or very underdevelopment infrastructure in an international scene, a scene of art, or how the artists try to uh, comment or worry about the technology, not only in the sense of um, a support or as, as tools, but also about how the technology transform our ideas, our social imaginaries, and about um, our mentalities or our, our relationship with the context. The first exhibition was uh, made in, in 2006, and what I wanted to do was to show what happened with this artist, how to present a history of the Cuban contemporary art, media, digital, and technology art in a country as, as Canada. And at the same time, to show which are the uh, ideas or the preoccupation or the problematics that the Cuban artist uh, wants or had related to the technology. For example, Raul Cordero is one of the most important Cuban artists. He began to work with technology from the, from the end of the 90s. And this is what, it was one of his first installation. It actually is a photography installation, but he considered it like a technology piece. And the title of the piece is, let me tell you a video. And what is happening is he wanted to do a video, but he didn't have how to do. He didn't have the tools, he didn't have the camera, he didn't have the technology. And then he decided to, uh, be, to tell to somebody about the idea of the video that he wanted to do. And he takes some pictures, he film, film he, he take a record? Yeah, he filmed. He's, yeah, he, yeah. He's self Photographed. Photography and films. And filmed himself. And yeah. then he print the pictures and this was the uh, video installation that he present. He present himself in the, um, in, in the screen of the TV or telling to the audience the video that he wanted to do. Did you follow me? Yes. <laughs> okay. This was another example. For example, this is an artist, Glenda Leon. She was a photographer and performer artist. And she tried to connect, to connect uh, uh, or to show how the photography was the previous uh, past. The, related to the video art, but at the same time, how you can see the, in the video art some image very similar to the um, uh, photography. And what she decided to do was to, to do some video art in a very rustic way when you can see uh, the, the part, the, the edition, very primitive, very naive, but in a, at the same time a very poetical level 
about the reality, about her brains, about how she understands the, the reality or the life. This is Fernando Rodriguez, another artist. He, he was a sculptor and paint, painter, but he wanted also to begin to do video art, and then he created, in this case, this installation, this room, where uh, talking about the condition of an island, because we live um, with water around, rodeado, um, with the sea around us, very isolated from the world, with very uh, few possibilities to cross the sea or to travel around. But at the same time, this island is in a very um, insegura, insure, insecure. Insecure, uh, insecure position, in not, not only in the political way, but also in the geographical, because every year we have been uh, um, attacked by the hurricane. The and hurricanes. in the summer, when the hurricane comes, uh, every year disappear or transforms our life, our reality, and we always are beginning again the life and we are always beginning a process and this is like a um, desti destination or something like that it's like a un destino manifiesto right uh, manifest destiny and this is the what the the general idea of this uh, video installation that you can see through the windows and the in the windows you can see a video with two mountains and a small house, and with, when the hurricane comes, the house moves to the other mountain, and when the other hurricane comes, he moves again to the other mountains, and, and this is the, in general, the video. And this is another artist, Sandra Ramos. In this case, she put together the, these uh, very uh, big objects. We have a traditional ceremony in Cuba that comes from the Afro-Cuban religious. It's the December 17. It's the San Lazaro days. It's a very important god for the Cuban people. This is his, his neck, neck? Uh, necklace. Yeah. And what she wants to do was to film, to do a video in the ceremony where the people go every year to uh, bless, uh -huh. to bless, to to ask mm -hmm. to the sun because you are developed, because you are alive, because you are salute, health, health, and at the same time she introduced this object, which is the image of San Lazaro. But when you enter on the room as the audience, you are participating also on the ceremony as part of the uh, San Lazaro Day. And this is Luis Gomez, for example. This is a picture where he taken a steal from uh, Nosferatu, the va vampires, you say? Vampir vampiro? Vampire. Vampires. And the text that you can see here is the text when you buy or you get a, a program, a, a technology, a software, a software, and you can read or you can sign the, an agreement that you cannot give this uh, technology to countries like Cuba, Iran, Iraq, Chinese, because they are terrorist countries. But because we are uh, vampires, <laughs> we take all around the world all what we want or all what we need, and we do uh, whatever we want with that. <laughs> and this is the, the, the picture. It's, it, the image is not so good, but if you read, you can understand what I am talking about. And this is, was another. What I am trying to explain you is how this artist comes from a very conceptual tradition. They produce a kind of work that looks like a very installation, conceptual installations, but at the same time, they are producing technology even when the technology is very um, poor. Mm -hmm. And in this case, for example, this artist discovered in the web, on the web that somebody that you uh, sell, sell lands from Mars. 
and he decided to buy <laughs> a, an acre, acre? 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 acre of Mars. Do you can imagine a Cuban artist with an acre of Mars? <laughs> and he decided to create a, a promotion for this, uh, this man, this business, this enterprise, uh -huh. company. Uh -huh. Right. I don't know how to say this, this entrepreneur. Yeah, entrepreneur. And he created this video uh, where you can see with the, when he said uh, that the only condition uh, to to do this promotion is don't create uh, nations, okay. don't create uh, patrias, a country, yeah, countries or nation. Mm -hmm. And but the the project has another part, second part when he will give, he will donate his acre of Mars to the cemetery in Havana. <laughs> and the first part of this, um, of this project is create a website again, this person, which is the owner of the Mars, uh -huh. because he is selling the land of Mars. Mm -hmm. And this is a very mix kind of work which is in the in the borders of something which is not real uh, is, which is not a real uh, technological war but uh, at the same time is a web uh, is a um, is a war for the web but it's not for the web you know it's in the middle of all this kind of process and for example Lazaro Saavedra which is one of the most important concept, concept conceptual artists in Cuba that come from the 80s, he always was also very interesting to produce video art. But at, the, at that point, he uh, dedicated to, um, to do animations. But for the exhibition, he decided to create an installation to show how he was during 10 years, almost 10 or 12 years, trying to do uh, a, an animation. And he presented the storyboard of, the, uh, of one animation and also a, a projection using, using a very old projector with uh, projecting to a mirror that at the same time transmit the image to the screen. It's a kind of way to, uh, to show the interior of the process to produce an, an, an artwork, but at the same time, the history of how he produced the, the work. And this is Abel Barroso. Actually, this article was not at the exhibition, but I incorporate at the end of this uh, part of the presentation, because it's an artist that has been also talking about technology, producing um, computers or another kind of technology in good. For example, the first image that you can see there is a cafe internet for the first world. It was in the biennial of, of 2001, I think so. And the people can go to this cafe internet and can use, they can use uh, the, the machines, the computer, in a very artisanal, they are a very artisanal machine, and you can read a lot of things about the Caribbean, countries, about our peripheral condition, about our cultures. But he also produced this robot, made it by good? Good? Uh, Madera? Madera? Wood. 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 Oh, sorry. Wood. And the, the interesting was that this uh, robot was in Japan in a performance with the Asimo robot which is a very famous um, robot from the scientific in, in Japan. This perform this um, in, uh, encounter, 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 this meeting between, between the boss robot was transmitted by the TV in Japan, and this is the performance at the gallery where he was inside the, the machine. In the biennial, uh, an exhibition dedicated totally to the uh, technology. We have had some artists that work with the technology, but in different exhibitions of the biennial, um, participating to the general topic of the biennial, but not as a, 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 an exhibition dedicated to 
technology. In this case, uh, Luis Gomez, who is a, a very important artist and also the director of the uh, media department of our institute in Havana, was cooperated with me. And we uh, present the principal idea was to put together some piece that works with low technology or high technology to show the way that our contest or our country or our countries try to um, cross the border of or the limitation that our life. The Mariano Sardon piece was a piece connected to a database, database in, in the, on the web uh, that transformed it when the people is using this database about, is a poem from uh, uh, the Argentine poet, uh, oh my God, Borges. Borges. <laughs> Is the is the sand booth from Jorge Luis Borges, and when the people use the this site on the web, the piece transform. Also, the people on the gallery can use the the sands uh, and the image of the books and transform also the books from the gallery. And another piece is Levi Orta who create this kind of bomb. You say bomb? Mm -hmm. Bomb, domestic bomb, that uh, in a certain moment can could be could could produce an escape of you humor, humo, smoke, smoke, and this this bomb was programmed, and the condition was that the curator of the biennial or me, or I, has had to do a, a cellular phone, uh -huh. a, cel a, a call phone to uh, disactivate the bomb. <laughs> if we don't de do the disactivation, the bomb will be, um, the gallery will be uh, filled with smoke. Uh, yeah, exactly. And this is another piece from a Cuban artist. Uh, it's a commentary about the, rela the actually the last uh, piece was a commentary about the relationship between art and, the, and institution how uh, there is a, a, a permanent negotiation between the artists and the galleries, the artists and the curators, and how the curator is in the middle of this relationship between the artists and the institution, and how it functions particularly in the case of Cuba. And this was a piece about where the artist was uh, creating a, a kind of plateau. Plateau? Plateau. Uh, is a, with a sensor, with sound, when you can hear the last uh, dialogue in the, um, the field 2001 Odisea Espacial. 2001 Odisea Espacial? 2001 and 2001. Yeah. What do you say in English? Spatial Odyssey. Oh, Space Odyssey. Thank you. I was and, like, I'm. And in a certain way, also, it's a commentary about the end of the utopia, about the end of uh, a period of our life, about the commitment between the technology and the society. And this was a piece from a very important uh, German artist, Michael Bialiski and Camilla Richter. Michael is the director of ZKM. ZKM is a museum of technology in Germany. And his piece, The Garden of Errors and Decadence, was connected with Twitter, with uh, Facebook, with different kind of community online. And the, uh, the piece transformed all the time with uh, this connection. And this is the piece of Luis Gomez, Patricia Clark, and Barry Bond. Luis Gomez is the Cuban artist, Patricia and Barry are American artists, and it's a piece uh, what was very important, the interactivity with the audience. And for us, it was very important in, the, in general at the exhibition to have this kind of participation because almost always uh, uh, the audience has very affair, affair? Has to work hard. Temeroso? Yeah, has to um, make an effort. Uh, uh, to participate, to, to connect or to interact with the technology, with the piece, and in this case, uh, fortunately, we we get the, we had the possibility that every time the people was trying to be part of the piece, and this is the piece of Martinez Isaac, which is a 
couple of artists from Colombia and Argentina. They, they were here. I don't know if they are here right now. And the piece was very interesting because every element is part of the, was take it from the street, is a second hand uh, technology. And he created, they created a program that people can uh, to produce a world of art using the, the piece. And at the same time, the piece was connected with a database that can um, consider or put the value of this uh, world of art that the people is creating, comparating with the art market, the Latin American art market at the moment. And this is Bill Bohr, an artist from Canada that has this very interesting installation, Hysterical Machine, and was a connection between the people and the machine. And every time when the people trying to be close to the machine, the machine becomes hysterical and produce sound, light, um, a very r rare. Rara? Rara? Rare, unusual. Yeah, unusual atmosphere. And this was Emmanuel Sevigny also, also from Canada. And his piece was on the street, was a kind of mapping over a, a building on the city. It was a wonderful piece. And for us all, also was very important, but for, for the first time, the Cuban people, the common Cuban people had the opportunity to be in contact with international artists that work with a very high technology and with a very strong uh, possibility to develop ideas on the street or public space. This is Antonio Gomez. It's a piece, another, another kind of piece also to uh, connect in relationship with the public. The, the piece had some sensors and when you are close to there, the, the screen moving and you can read, you can read the text there. And English Bassman with this very uh, a simple machine that the, the title was Pinochet's Dilemma. There was a big nose, noise? Mm -hmm. nose? Yeah, big nose, Pinocchio. Moving, moving in this world and in front there was the mouse uh -huh. moving at the same time of the noise. And, for, and in this case, Yusnir Mental created a, site, a website to promote the Cuban artists. But the problem is that in Cuba, the possibility to connect is very low. And you can, for example, if you want to see a video by internet, it is impossible. If you want to see, I wanted to see the program of ISEA program by internet, and it was impossible because the connect is very bad. And uh, uh, what happened with the piece was that while the artist pr introduced his words on the website, the, uh, the piece don't function mm -hmm. because there is a lot of images to see mm -hmm. and the, the velocity becomes low and low and low. And uh, this is the last piece was actually was a performance. The artist uh, gave us a... Um, 500 books uh, is a novel from him. Uh, it's a novel based in, a, in another sound piece produced by him. And in this case, we transform the piece in a performance and in a sound piece where it's not the machine, the principal object, but the person, no, an actress, uh, some performance, but also some people. The people had to take a book with the condition that to sit and to read some page of the book to the rest of the audience. This is what I wanted to show, the two examples of way to uh, present the technology in Cuba or outside Cuba uh, from the Cuban artists, our Latin American artists. Thank you very much. With this diversity of presentations, uh, I don't quite know where to start. So I'd, I'd like to ask our participants if you have questions for each other um, or compare and contrast ideas of um, your projects versus other projects. Um, I think if others don't have a question, do you have a question, Nancy? 
Well, I, one of the things that I, I thought about as I was listening to the other presentations was um, in 2007, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People actually paid attention to the ability to make art. That's part of the declaration. It is a human right to be able to produce artwork and to have access to that artwork. So I, I guess the main larger question we have is, you know, technology, which has in the past been used as sometimes a tool of oppression, you know, does that enable that human right? And in what ways, what kind of parameters um, does that, what does that look like? Oh. Was that directed no. at Denise? Well, yeah, maybe it's starting with Denise, yeah. Can you, can you say it shorter? <laughs> so we, were, we were consulting on a plan, sorry. To, yes. um, I, guess, I guess shortly, briefly, would be, does technology enable the human right of, of art making? You know, is, is that, it's, it, has it been used as a tool of oppression? Is it a tool of liberation? Just her musings on that. Well, uh, I think there is two ways to understand the relationship uh, of the technology at this moment. Actually, uh, technology is something that has been always on the world, but different kind of technology. And the technology transforms our way to think, transform our tools. And the, te the technology that we use at that point connect us in a very global situation and permit us to have access to different kind of things that in another way will be impossible. And it means that for me, technology means, in the in related to the art, a possibility to use a new, um, a new way, a new tool, tools, but not only to produce a new way of art or, or a new style of art, but a new way of communication between the people. For me, it's the most important that the technology is apporting, apporting, offering, offering, offering to our uh, contemporary. This is in thinking from the art, but thinking from the humanity, from the human being, from the rights, human rights, is also a way to be clear, it's also a right. And I think the technology becomes something important, but not as, a, as, a, end? as, an, end? as an end, but as a methodology or process to understand our life and our historical process, but, and also our specific context related to the rest of the world. I don't know if it, this is, was the question. I think I would also add that rather than it being, either or, um, oh, or rather than it being oppressive anymore, um, that that really with, with access to technology and access to being able to see so much artwork we can't go visit, so many exhibitions we can't go see, um, that there is so much more opportunity to experience art. And having been in Danny's country a few times, I, I, I also know that access to the internet, however slow it might be, opened up the world of contemporary art to younger Cuban artists who were, were in many ways shut off from the contemporary art dialogue that were happening, that was happening just even 90 miles away. Um, and so I think that that has really enriched um, uh, um, also a, a cross-cultural exchange that doesn't always uh, mean we need to wait for visas. And <laughs> Well, it makes me think of, you know, in terms of a medium um, with Native arts and especially in the Southwest, you know, I, I teach American Indian art to college students and they come into the classroom and they really do expect pottery, they expect weaving. Even at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, people will walk in and turn around. If they're seeing things they're not used to seeing, they expect to see 
the commerce aspect. And so I think, you know, the ability to be able to work in lens-based media has been really very freeing. I think those expectations, though, are um, sometimes more based than uh, we would like them to be. I certainly think that for the ISEA 2012 conference being hosted here in New Mexico, that was something that much of the outside world, or at least the United States outside world, was not prepared for. I think uh, there are many people that understand contemporary art as basically being site Santa Fe. Um, a perfect example was last, uh, two weeks ago, the New York Times uh, ran their year in review, sort of preview of upcoming events. Uh, the New York Times decided not to list the ISEA exhibitions and conference as one of the major art events here in the United States, but listed here in New Mexico two exhibitions of Georgia O'Keeffe. Mm -hmm. um, that fits a uh, New Mexico expectation, and yet this doesn't necessarily. Uh, so I think that that idea of the rights to represent something beyond the stereotype um, may be an expansion of that idea of the international rights of artists to be who they are and to do the things that they want to do. Um, are, is, are there questions from the, were you raising your hand for a question? Or does anybody have any questions or comments from the audience? Before we, Yes. The comment was, for those who couldn't hear, um, about the expectations of Native American artists and a desire uh, by some people to present Native American arts that may fit into an expected tradition as opposed to allowing Native artists to experience uh, or, or experiment with art forms such as holograms. Yeah, and I, I would agree about your comment that there needs to be an increased dialogue and there's a lot of educational work to be done. Um, you know, I often look at funding agencies um, you know, certainly museums and public institutions, I think, have a responsibility to be able to lead those dialogues. But I also am, you know, involved often myself as an active grants writer and being able to find that category that people will support either for a residency or an exchange or travel or just core funding for materials, you know, there's often an inclination to look towards a folkloric you know, the crafts, um, I, I would like to see you know, more opening up in terms of medium, what's funded out there. There are some good examples. The Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian Film and Video Festival, I can't say enough good things about that organization. I think in film, there seems to be some movement and some support, but for the experimental um, arts that I think you're mentioning in terms of holograms and, and uh, other or the forms of art. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Maybe well, I think we, we can't forget that every time a new technology has appeared, and I think photography is a really great example to start with, it wasn't really accepted then as fine art, and it was for so long separated as another less, less important kind of art. Um, as, new t as each new technology has been introduced, and, and the artist is there right at the beginning to play with it and challenge it and mess with it and, and use it, um, it does take curators, institutions, collectors, some time to catch up. Um, so what you're describing is really, is also part of a, of a longer history of uh, sort of the institution needing to kind of catch up and get, 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 get um, um, more comfortable with, with that technology before it starts to come into the, the, the museum or the collection. So I think we can see that kind of history um, and, and as, as myself, as a, as a curator, I'm not looking at the medium. I'm looking at the idea and the way, the, the, the way in which that idea is presented visually, no matter what form you have chosen to use to express that. Um, but we can't forget that there are often fears with new technologies um, even you know, for museums, how do you collect something that has a has a that is a computer code? How are we going to bring that into the collection? And how are we going to preserve it? And what if what if the platform changes? And all these kinds of questions, um, I think, just lead to um, uh, or com come from a lack of sort of understanding and and a need for to under to, to be more educated about what each new idea and technology is and can be. Yes. Or, or Dennis, did you have? Yes, I wanted to 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 sing about. It's not exactly the same, but um, I I will, I like to sing always in technology as a traditional way of knowledge, and technology as a, a about information about the age of information, our age. Because, uh, for example, there is a wonderful book, uh, it was a catalog that, from MoMA, that I remember now. The title of this exhibition was, hi was High and Low. It was a, it's, a, it's a very important research about the relationship between high culture and low culture in the modernism, in the avant-garde of the 20th century. And this, when you read the book, you can see how this connection was through the technology. Because the, the avant-garde artist has been discovering the modernity through the new machines, through the new elements, through the new tools. And I introduce this idea now because the difference that I see uh, on the wave of technology that we are using is that our technologies, our soci information societies of technology, I don't know if this is the way to say in English, uh, is more um, oppressive. It's a, it's a society, it's a time where the technology becomes in some sense very close to the power. And this is because it's very important, important to think the technology in relationship with the everyday life and to think art and technology in relationship with the everyday life. For example, in countries like Cuba, and Cuba is not the, the bad, the most bad, the, the, the worst, the worst <laughs> example, but it's a complicated example. Uh, the people don't have any idea about how to use, I don't know. I, I have been traveling around the world every year and I don't know how to, to look for my ticket in the machine on the, on the airport. I don't want to do. Every time I go to the bureau, the counter, yeah. yeah, and I say, I, I am from Cuba. I don't know, I don't know how to do. And they give me the, if somebody send me by mail the, the ticket, perfect. But, it's, but it's, I have to look for that on the machine. I don't know how to do, because I, I, didn't, I never use that. 
And I am a person that has a very special position in Cuba. I am not a common of the people. My mother now, I am totally disconnected with my family, with my daughters, because my mother don't know how to use the machine. And I have a machine in my house, and I have a mail in my house. I have to look in for a neighbor, somebody, please, every night you have to go to my house, you have to connect to know how are the children. You know, it's something very simple, very from the everyday life. And these kind of things separate the people, create difference of the people. And this is the reason because to think on technology related to the art is a compromise or a commitment to think on the, about the everyday life, I think. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. you had a question. Is that directed to one person, or would you like each? To all of you, I'm wondering, the question is, uh, how much free choice do each of these curators have in the selection of artists and works of art for their exhibitions and shows? So I guess in the example that I shared, uh, we have complete freedom. So uh, you probably saw the flags on the Zatari outside. Um, you know, John Hitchcock, the artist, said, I think today I'm taking the exhibit on the waterfront. Um, you know, there are other days we took certain artwork down, but you know, this comes at a price because for us, our, our funding is very sporadic. And we actually expect the artist to fundraise on their own to get themselves over there. Sometimes we have apartments. We, as I say, sleep in a heap. Um, and, um, you know, really have worked outside of the official system to be able to make a presence. And, and part of it is because we have that freedom. Um, and, and there's no uh, economic attachment, you know, for us. We're not paying fees. Now, the, I guess the offset is, is that it's difficult for a lot of people to know that we're there. Um, the Venice papers include us, which is fantastic. So we've kind of let go of audience as well. We've let go of objects, we've let go of audience, and the whole premise for the initiatives that I shared with you is that we are allowing Native artists to make a culturally meaningful statement on an international stage. And, and, and that's, that's our main goal. So I would say for myself, I, I don't work under an institution at all, and, and I don't even select the artwork. I just make the opportunity available for other people. I have the... Um rather unique position of being both the director and the chief curator. Um, and so that, that gives me a great amount of freedom. Um, I was, was hired to, um, you know, ba based on the, my past curatorial work, and I am given a great amount of, of freedom in shaping a program for my institution. Um, my role as also the director means I also have to raise all the money for it and the kind of conversations that I used to have and negotiations I used to have with my directors about, well, did we raise all the money? What are we going to cut? How are we going to negotiate that? Now is a conversation with myself and, and really, um, uh, and, and yet I don't, I, I'm, I'm not just bringing my complete brand or style of, of um, and, and all of my interests to this institution. As I said, I feel like I, I, because I've always been a curator within an institution, I have an enormous responsibility to that particular institution and to creating a program although there's tremendous amount of creativity and freedom within that, but creating a program that is appropriate for the history of the institution, a relationship to it, it having a collection or not, the community, um, and all of those factors shape the decisions I make. Um, and as far as my relationship with, with my board, um, it is my job early on in an, when I have an idea for something, um, even if it's, if it's a really radical idea, is to bring them along early on and get buy-in. So, so that's, the, that's the director side also. So it's constantly having to advocate for artists and ideas. 
Well, in my case, I have been working as a freelance sometimes and as a part of an institution, the Wilfredo Land Center, which is the institution that organized the biennial. And for me, the, the free has two, two limits. One is an, an eti the ethic position. The ethic position that you um, take in front of the society. Not a society in terms of the state, but in terms of the citizen. citizen, to the citizen. My relationship with the community, my relationship with my position as citizenship. This is important in the moment to take a decision to put or not a, a war, and the other limit is the negotiation. You have to be, even as a freelance, um, as part of institution, of course, it's the same. The negotiation is one of the most important part of the process, of the curatorial process. We have, for example, for the biennial, we have, have had a lot of projects that we have we cannot put in the play when we want because the, this part of the city, the owner is the municipality or the other one is the patrimonial office. Or you have to negotiate every time. For example, in Open Score, Emmanuel Sevigny, the, the, art, the, the artist that the projection over the building was uh, the idea, the original idea was to be on the um, La parte de atrás, the back part of the building where there was the exhibition. But the exhibition was in the Old Havana. And the Old Havana is part of the, of the historian office. The, it's a patrimonial office. And we, we didn't get, actually we didn't ask about the possibility to do. Because we say, you know what? Then we say no. We have, <laughs> we have to look for another place. And we moved to Vedado in a very nice, which is a very nice neighborhood, neighborhood which is a very nice park. And we put over a very important uh, theater. And it was the best because the piece was made for this building about the history of the building and about the history of the neighborhood. And it, it was wonderful. And then we put on the gallery um, a, docu document? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a document yeah. of the projection. The projection was happened every night, and we put on the gallery just the documentation. This is part of the negotiation, and this is part of the limit of our free as curator. We have time for one more, one final question. Yes, sir. Um, I Sure. I think what made what made us reconsider it was uh, w there were a number of factors. One, I think we were seeing less and less of the art world coming. So where were our colleagues? Where was the press? Where was right? Um, we, as I was studying the history, it was very difficult to even. Um, understand what the uh, character of it was. What was the structure? What, what defined it other than that it was in the building? Uh, from year to year, things changed so dramatically, sometimes more successful than others. Um, I think that sites biennial started to become part of the international circuit. Um, there, there is at least one, maybe two biennials that when the curator was announced, we all could have guessed who would be in the show, and that's who was in the show. And I really didn't want to be part of that, and wanted to break that mold and, and come up with a structure um, and, a, and a focus um, that I think was, was much more ambitious and exciting and worth coming to see. That help? Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about what your hopes for the new event are? Or 
Um, I can tell you what my hopes are. I can't tell you what it is yet. Um, although we're getting, we're getting close to, being, to, to um, announcing what it is. But I think my, my hopes are that we put um, our institution um, sort of back on the map and, and a visit to Santa Fe and New Mexico becomes you know, again, something that many people in the art world are interested in doing, and we have this sort of lar we, we, we become part of this larger conversation again. Um, I want to to create something that that includes voices that are not often included in international biennials. That is one of the things that will happen. I hope with that, the idea we're working on, um, and and so that we are. It is not. When you come to what this new show will be, it's, there's no mistaking where you are in the world. It's not just another biennial. All of that is my, is my hope. Not too ambitious, right? Okay. <laughs> we wish you the greatest. <laughs> Thank you. It'll be wonderful to see. I can't wait to see that. Um, with that remark, I would like uh, to thank our panelists, Dan Danis Montes de Oca Moreira, uh, Irene Hoffman, and Nancy Marie Mitlow for this wonderful panel. And Nancy, thank you very much for generating the idea of this panel. Uh, thank you to all of the 90 different collaborating organizations that have participated in presenting Isaiah 2012. And thank you all for attending this afternoon. And I would encourage you to engage our panelists in discussions off the stage so that we can set up for the next program after this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.